Good morning. All the different members I'm, and all that have joined in to be with for this morning on this series. My name is John Swader, and I'm here to do the, the opening devotion prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, the giver and the stain of life. Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning, Father. Father, we just thank you for allowing us to come this way one more time. Father, we thank you for the bread and water that you have provided for us, Father. Father, we ask your blessing upon this church, Father. Father, be with us, Father, as we go through this service, Father. We ask you to your blessing to be upon us, Father. Father, we thank you for our pastor, Father, and his family, Father. We pray that you will keep them, Father. Father, we thank you for our pastor and Mary the Carpenter, Father, and his family. Be with them also. Father, we ask you to bless the sick and the shut in, Father. Bless the one that don't know you in the point of their sin, Father. We pray that something to say or done, Father, today that they will come running. What must I do to be saved, Father? Father, we just thank you, Father. Like this, Father, we thank the one that, are, that you will be the one on the sick bed, Father. We pray for those that are going through this hour of separation. Father, be with them also, Father. And again, Father, we ask your blessing upon this church, Father, and blessing upon this servant that it will be pleasing in their sight. And Father, be with our pastor. He delivered your word, Father. In Jesus' name, I do pray. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters would have overwhelmed us. The stream would have gone over our soul. Then the swollen waters would have gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Pastor Franklin from Bethel Missionary Baptist Church coming to you first of all, just welcome you to our virtual Sunday morning worship service. Thank you for joining us. We hope and pray it's a blessing to you. Listen, we want you to do a couple things, especially if you're a first time visitor, Drop it in the comments. Let us know you're here. Tell us where you're worshiping from so that we can welcome you like you're a part of the Bethel family already. We're trying some new things here, so we want you to be patient with us. Keep praying for us uh, as we try to navigate this time and this season for our church, as so many churches are. But we're looking forward to what God is going to do, how he's already been blessing us, and how he's going to bless us going forward into the future. So listen, sit down, chill out. Grab your notebook, grab your pen, get ready for the word today. We know it's going to be a blessing to you, and we're looking forward to seeing you again the next time we worship. God bless you. Take care. Peace. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us once again on today. Let's get into our word for this Sunday. We started a series on last week when we started talking about the gospel of justice. Uh, we're looking at social justice issues and issues of uh, oppression and liberation within the Bible, trying to address some of the things that we see going on in our very world today with civil unrest and the social injustice that we're witnessing. So today I want to go and see if we can go to a old well to get fresh water. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and it reads this way. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength 
and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hand of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him a mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. I want to talk today and put a tag on this text. There's more to it than that. There's more to it than that. Let's say a quick prayer and then we'll get into the word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, this opportunity to worship again, uh, even by virtual means. We pray now, Lord, that you would join us in this preaching moment. Open our hearts and minds to what it is you have to say to us in this time for this season. I pray for each and every person who is on the stream, who is watching from home, from work, uh, from their bedroom, wherever they may be. Bless them more than they can stand it. And we pray, Lord, that something is said today to encourage them, strengthen them, restore their hope, Lord God, and allow them to live more faithfully according to your word, your will, and your way. Have your way in this place. Have your way with these, your people, and have your way with this, your preacher. It's in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. If you agree with that prayer, do me a favor, hit some likes, hit some hearts, hit some smiley faces, whatever it is. Uh, we want you to agree with that prayer in the comments. I want to talk about there's more to it than that. Now, if you're like me, you've probably had some interesting conversations over the past couple months. Uh, the viral video of the murder of Ahmad Arbery at the beginning of this year. Light being shined on the killing of Breonna Taylor in Louisville the killing of George Floyd on video for everyone to see, the killing of Rashard Brooks on video for everyone to see. All of these events have caused so many people to have some interesting conversations about racism and injustice in America, conversations about policing in America, conversations about justice in America, and conversations about the gospel. What does the gospel say about these things, if anything at all? What bearing does it have on these circumstances? How should we interpret what so many of us know in our heart of hearts to be wrong and undoubtedly grieves the heart of God. What does the gospel have to say about this? Famed theologian and preacher John MacArthur has gone so far as to deem the idea of a social justice gospel a fallacy. He calls it dangerous and false teachings that threaten what he considers to be the true gospel. He is so opposed to social justice that he drafted a statement to stand against the idea of it that was signed by thousands of other Christian leaders throughout our country. And even with those who are not of the notoriety of John MacArthur, I have had some conversations concerning the gospel 
and social justice, the, 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 the gospel and systemic racism. People have had trouble reconciling what they see with their eyes and what they feel in their spirit with the gospel they've come to, un come to understand and adopt. There is a turmoil that is taking place on the inside of many people because they have received a disjointed gospel, a gospel that is narrowly defined and void of complexity and therefore easily explained and followed. This gospel, the gospel is this and only this, that Jesus came to save you from your sins and take you to heaven when you die. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The gospel is solely synonymous with the salvation of one's soul for eternity and in many people's minds anything else becomes a distraction from the true gospel. Now, let me be clear today before I get in any trouble on this live stream. I'm not saying that that idea, that belief, that scripture is not the gospel. All I want to have you consider today is maybe there's more to it than that. Now, 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 now I don't want to be painted a heretic that espouses a works-based salvation model. Let me be clear. I believe that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. I am suggesting simply that we avoid narrowly defining what the gospel is. After all, that word gospel, you already know, means good news. And here is what Jesus does when he announces his ministry in Luke chapter four. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I want you to pay attention to that last phrase. The year of the Lord's favor is a reference to the year of Jubilee. Can I, can I nerd out with you for just a moment? I want you to get this. Here's your nerd note for this sermon on Sunday. The year of Jubilee is a year that comes around every 50th year in Jewish culture. And it comes along to bring social and economic justice. Every 50 years in Jewish culture, social and economic justice is restored on the year of Jubilee. What happens on the year of Jubilee, Pastor? Good, uh, that's a good question. That's why I like preaching here, because you ask good questions. Here it is. On the year of Jubilee, slaves were freed. Debts were canceled and forgiven. And property that had been lended is returned to its original, original owners. And that's not it. Get this. The year of Jubilee was signaled by the blowing of a ram's horn on the Day of Atonement. On the day, watch this, where sins were dealt with, social and economic justice resulted. I'll say it again. On the day, on the time, at the moment that sins were atoned for, what resulted was social and economic justice, which suggests that social transformation ought to be a byproduct of spiritual transformation. What am I saying? That if you understand, if your understanding of the gospel, your understanding of the good news is Jesus' salvation mission for your personal soul and nothing more, there might be more to it than that. When, when, when people try to take Jesus' announcement as purely spiritual, referring only to spiritual liberation, I'm just thinking there might be more to it than that. What, what, what does good news look like to innocent, innocent inmates locked up on death row? What, what, what does good news look like to immigrant families caged and separated at the border? 
What kind of gospel allows you to shout about Sunday but be silent about my pain on Monday? What kind of gospel allows you to shout glory to the heavens on Sunday but ignore injustice toward me every other day of the week? All I'm saying is maybe, maybe there's more to it than that. While, while, while some contend that it's dangerous to marry social justice to the gospel, I contend that they are indeed inseparable. While some may think the two are in competition for attention, I contend that one is not complete without the other. I'm not attempting to add to the doctrine of soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. I'm not attempting to add to the biblical canon of the 66 books of the Bible. I'm not saying that social justice is how you are saved. I'm suggesting that the constricted understanding of the gospel may need some expanding, may, may need some stretching, it may need some reconsideration. Can I, can I try to use Jesus to plead my case? Amen. Thank you. Give me a few minutes. I'll try to be out of your way. In our text today, you probably know it well, a lawyer comes to Jesus asking a question about salvation. How can I inherit eternal life? Jesus answers the question with a question and the lawyer answers his own question. What what does the law say? Jesus asked the lawyer answered back like he was taking a test. Lord, it says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus does not say, wait, stop. Don't worry about that second part about the neighbor. Jesus does not make a division or demarcation between loving God as necessary for eternal life while loving your neighbor is optional. Jesus says both parts are true. And when he repeats it, he says, you got it. Go go ahead and do this and you will have the eternal life that you seek. And then the lawyer asked the question, either for clarity, but probably for controversy. Who is my neighbor. I love this. The man asked him a question about the requirements of inheriting eternal life. He asked him a question that is salvific in nature. And the response he gives to his own question is twofold. Love God passionately and love others empathetically. And when he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds with a parable that addresses a social injustice that was done to an innocent man minding his biggest walking from one way, one place to another. And Jesus lays out the response that is neighborly in nature and seemingly a prerequisite for inheriting eternal life. I'm just talking about the text. Jesus says, I know you want things to be as simple as keeping things between you and God and then getting the specifics on who your neighbor is so that you only have to love certain people and not others. But there's more to it than that. And I think this text helps us to have a well-rounded understanding of what ought to be considered the gospel good news. Here's the question. What can we glean from this text that helps us to fulfill the requirement to be neighborly and position ourselves for an inheritance of eternal life? I'm glad you asked. Let's see what the text can show us. Here it is. The first thing the Samaritan shows us is that the Samaritan recognizes the suffering of others. He recognizes the suffering of others. You know the story. I just rehearsed it. Man coming from Jerusalem, headed to Jericho, fell in the hands of robbers. They beat him, stripped him, left him for dead. The text does not indicate that the man was wearing the wrong colors in the wrong neighborhood at the wrong time. The, the, the scriptures do not say whether or not some gambling debt he had from a few months ago had finally caught up with him. The text does not indicate that the man did anything at all to end up in the position that he was in. Call it what you want. Call it bad luck. Call it misfortune. You could even call it life. It wasn't anything he said. It wasn't anything he did. 
Like so many of us, this man is having to deal with a situation that he did not provoke or solicit because sometimes that's life. And by all accounts, this man was a law abiding citizen. He is simply a victim of his circumstance. Yet it seems so often in this day and age for us to blame the suffering for the suffering they're enduring. No doubt there are consequences for our actions, but it seems that some folks suffer consequences for no reason at all. And the blame is laid at the feet of the one who is suffering rather than recognizing the circumstances that cause the suffering. If she was sexually harassed, it's her own fault. She shouldn't have been wearing that skirt in here. She was asking for it. If he was unjustly killed. It's his own fault. He didn't move quickly enough at the officer's commands. If he would have listened, he'd still be alive. If they are poor, it's their own fault. They don't need to be on government assistance. If they would just get off the couch and start working and quit being lazy, they wouldn't have to worry about all of that. Let me tell you something. This is convenient commentary from the other side of the street. It is easier to blame the victim than it is to acknowledge the suffering of the victim. Because as long as it's their fault, it's not our responsibility. As long as it's their fault, it's not your responsibility. Through no fault, though, of his own, this man was beaten, stripped, and left for dead. And as a matter of fact, the text says that he fell into the hands of robbers. He ain't do nothing. He just fell. When was the last time you just fell? The last time life tripped you up. The last time life caused you to stumble just a little bit. We have all fallen and found ourselves in places where we did not intend to end up. But sometimes life happens that way. And sometimes we end up falling just trying to traverse this journey of life. And the Samaritan comes along and he does not levy judgment on the man. For falling into a place he never intended to find himself, the Samaritan doesn't assume that he knows this man's story because everyone who is in this condition is a criminal and a drug dealer and lazy and a degenerate. Here it is for your notes. I want you to write this down. Check this out. Don't judge character based on circumstance. I'm going to say it again. Don't judge character based on circumstance. The Samaritan comes on the scene and comes across this fallen man and recognizes that this man is suffering. And I love this narrative because the previous pastors by, I'm going to teach for a minute, are a priest and a Levite. Let me, let me help you understand that. The priest is one who went into the Holy of Holies and interceded on behalf of the people. The priest is the preacher, the clergy, and the Levite is a descendant of the Levitical priesthood who served as what might be known today as associate or assistant ministers. Watch this. It was church folk that walked by this Samaritan. It was church folk who passed him by. It was church folk who ignored this man on the side of the road. And can I help you here? If we're going to be serious about the work that we do in the earth as a church and be representatives of the kingdom of God, we have to take a very real look at those who we pass by because we've made a judgment about who they are based on where we find them. Here he is the Samaritan comes on the scene, recognizes the man's suffering without attaching the man to his suffering. All the Samaritan knew was that there was a man on the street who was hurting. He saw a man that had endured some unfortunate events, had fallen on some difficult times, and was dealing with some turbulent circumstances. He saw a man who was left for dead, and it wasn't important how he got there. It wasn't important to ascertain how he might be responsible for his own misfortune. He simply needed to recognize that the man was suffering. Can I tell you why that is? I'm moving on to my second point. Just give me a second. Because the Samaritan knows suffering. 
If you know anything about the Samaritans, you will know that they're considered half breeds. They're mixed of Jewish and Gentile uh, blood and scorned by the Jews. They are looked down upon and marginalized by the Jews. You may recall the woman at the well who uh, reminds Jesus as Jesus tries to operate in a spirit of inclusivity that Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And I have to believe that the lived experience of the, this Samaritan allowed him to recognize this man's suffering. I have to believe that because the Samaritan knew what it felt like to be looked upon negatively for doing nothing, because of no fault of his own, that he was able to recognize this man's suffering. When he saw another man in a bad situation that was no fault of his own, it resonated with the passing Samaritan. Because when you've been through some stuff, you can recognize that analysis that sometimes people go through some stuff. And I may not have been through what you have been through, but I have been through some stuff. And, and if it had not been for the grace of God on my side, Lord knows where I might be. I've been through some stuff in my life. I've been one pink slip away and I've been one pack of ramen noodles away. I've been one midterm grade away. I've been one emotional setback away. I've been one cataclysmic event taking precedent in my life away from losing my mind. And if God God has not come see about me. I don't know what I might have done. It ain't my fault. I ain't do nothing wrong. I simply fell on some hard times because sometimes people go through some stuff. And so the Samaritan is able to recognize the suffering of others. Here's the second thing. The Samaritan is able to sympathize with the suffering of others. He's able to sympathize with the suffering of others. I'm in the text. This is what it says in verse 33. The Samaritan man saw the man left for dead, and the text says he was moved with pity. Another translation says it this way. The Samaritan felt compassion for the man. And beloved, one of the things that unsettles me about the days in which we find ourselves is the seemingly rapidly evaporating level of compassion that we have for one another. It is especially disheartening to see from the church and the people of God. Because if you read the Jesus narrative, Jesus had compassion as a hallmark of his ministry. You don't believe me. You need Bible. That's OK. I got some for you. Matthew chapter nine, verse 36. After teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the good news and curing the diseases, the text says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion for them. You need some more. Matthew 20 and verse 34. After encountering two blind beggars near the wall of Jericho who refused to shut up until they got their blessing. The text says moved with compassion. Jesus touched them and they immediately regained their sight. Colossians 3 and 12 admonishes us as children of God. It says as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. Here it is. Are you ready for it? Compassion is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of divinity. I'll say it again so you can put it in your in your notes. Compassion is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of divinity. And I'm no expert. But I believe that one of the contributing factors of our failure to clothe ourselves in compassion is that we fail to affirm and recognize the humanity of those around us. We group people together based on inaccurate caricatures and place labels of negativity upon them. And whenever you label someone, they become a little less of someone and a little more of something. And it's harder to sympathize with a statistic than it is with a person. It's a little harder to sympathize with a political party title than it is with someone who you see as human, just like you. 
People are no longer seen as unique creations of God, but as a threat to the values that they hold. They are no longer seen as a reflection of God's image, but a number that needs to be lowered because it's a drag on the economy. They're no longer seen as a person of value, but as a potential vote that needs to be pandered to for the powerful to remain in their positions. He's just like the rest of them. See, she's just another one of them. I wonder if that's anyone's testimony today that you've been labeled by someone else in your life. You, you, you've had some assumptions made about you, about who you are and about what you are about, which led to categorizing you as a what and not a who. What, 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 what are you about? Not who are you? Uh, what are you about? The more labels you place on someone, the more invisible their divine value becomes. And the more difficult it becomes to empathize, have compassion, and be moved with pity about the suffering of others. <clears throat> Here it is. I want you to share this part of the sermon on your Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever you got. Here it is. Share this. Don't label me if you didn't create me. I'll say it again. Don't label me if you did not create me. This man who was left for dead in the text was not another anything. He was the only one of him that God created. He was someone's son, could have been someone's brother or husband or someone's daddy. He was a part of the tapestry of humanity. And as divinely created in the image and likeness of God, he had infinite value. But the priest and the Levite walked by because they saw something and not someone. Because the only way, help me here, you can see a body in the street and keep walking by unmoved is if you see something that looks like roadkill instead of a person. You have to strip it of its humanity in order to reconcile and justify seeing a person lying, bleeding, half dead in the ditch and not doing a thing about it. The Samaritan affirms the man's humanity, and it led to him being able to sympathize with him. Compassion requires that we not only acknowledge the circumstances, but we also recognize the mark of the divine in those affected by the circumstances. Compassion requires that we understand that there are, they too are fearfully and wonderfully made. They too are made in the image and likeness of God. They too bear the imago Dei. They too were created a little lower than angels. Compassion requires, though, not just that we sympathize with those who are suffering, but that we empathize with them as well, that we put ourselves in their shoes. Because what the Samaritan understands is the story could have easily read another way if the Samaritan had just left the house a little earlier than he did. If he had left the house earlier, he could have been the one beaten and robbed and left for dead. If, if, if he had just left a little bit earlier and, and not paused to, to kiss his wife or, or to take out the trash, if, if some things that were seemingly out of his control had just turned another way, then he could have been the one that was left on the street for dead rather than this man. And he himself being labeled as a half-breed Samaritan, understanding that labels don't define me, labels can't strip me of my humanity, he becomes compassionate for his fellow man that he finds in the ditch. Instead of walking by and saying, I'm glad that's not me, the Samaritan said, that should not be anyone. No person lacks such value that it would be acceptable for them to be left in the street to bleed to death. Every child's inherent value ought to demand that anything less than a quality education for every single one is unacceptable. 
Every person's inherent value ought to demand that their life should be preserved as much as possible, regardless of insurance cards and pre-existing conditions. Every human's inherent value ought to demand that there should be no acceptable number of civilian casualties for drone strikes in war. If we are going to halt what's been called man's inhumanity to man, then we must clothe ourselves with compassion, clothe ourselves with the spirit of the divine and sympathize with those who have been left for dead. I got one more. I'm done. You got to recognize the suffering of others and you got to sympathize with the suffering of others. But here's what the Samaritan, uh, the Samaritan also shows us that helps us understand there may be more to it than that. You have to be able to relieve the suffering of others. After being moved with pity, the text says the Samaritan went to the man. And I think that's significant because it's easy to have pity from afar. In fact, I would offer for your consideration that the text doesn't indicate the priest and the Levite were callous or rude or insensitive or unsympathetic. They may have felt bad for him. They just didn't go to him. And the text says that the Samaritan went to the man. And I can't help but wonder if this is a word for us today who are chosen of God, saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, running around our sanctuaries whenever they open back up, that this is not enough to look on those with pity from afar. But being a good neighbor requires that we go to those who are in need. It's not enough to look from the other side of the street and feel bad for someone. Not enough to drive by the bridge and feel bad for those sleeping under it. It is our call to go to them in ministry. The Samaritan, it says, went to the man and it says he bandaged his wounds, put oil and wine on them and put him on his own animal. I like that, too, because it suggests that the Samaritan was riding his animal when he saw the man and in providing for his necessity, he got off of his high horse and placed the man on the animal and began to walk. And I can't help but wonder if this is a word for us about being a good neighbor, that it might require you to accept the possibility of being inconvenienced. Because for many of us, we make excuses that the reason we won't go to those in need is because it's just too much work. Interferes with life too much. It requires too much. I, I got too much going on in my own life. But the text suggests that good neighbors that fulfill the second part of this prerequisite for inheriting eternal life in the text are willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of meeting the needs of their fellow man. So the Samaritan is moved with pity. He goes to the hurting man. He bandages his wounds, puts him on his animal, takes him to an inn and cares for him through the night. And the next day he leaves him in the care of the innkeeper, giving him two denarii and promises to pay the man's bill for whatever else is spent when he returns to the inn. Let me see if I can contextualize it for you. Uh, he finds the man on the street. He pulls out his first aid kit. He bandages up his wounds, puts him uh, in the car, drives him to the, uh, to the hotel. I don't know. Let's say it's a, 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 a Hampton Inn and Suites. He drives him to the Hampton Inn, gets him out, goes to the front desk, says, I need a room for this man and myself. He takes care of him through the night. Next morning, he goes down to the front desk and leaves his credit card with the man at the front desk and says, I need you to make sure that anything he needs, he gets taken care of and you can run it on my car. I'll be back to pick him up at a later date, but just make sure because whatever else you need to spend on him, you can just put it on my tab. And I think that's significant because some of us won't spend money to help folk we know. The Samaritan starts a tab for a man that he just met. And some might suggest it was no big deal for the Samaritan. He must have been well off. That, that black card, that card was probably a black card. He had plenty of money. But, but, but I would suggest that that's even more impressive. Because we all know that there are some folk who have it and still won't give it. There's some folk 
it'd be no problem for, but they still don't want to let it go. And you might recall our Savior telling a young man who had, been seeming, had a seemingly shallow desire for eternal life to sell his possessions and give to the poor. And what did he say? The text says he walked away grieving because he had it, didn't want to give it. Here it is. Sacrifice is required if justice is to be rendered. Sacrifice is required if justice is to be rendered. I love Jesus in this text. Can I tell you why I love him? I love him because of how he sets this thing up to dig at the core of how we practice what we profess. Watch this. Jews and Gentiles are at odds with one another. Jews and Samaritans do not get along. But Jesus, a Jewish teacher, tells a story with a Samaritan hero. He, 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 he's Jewish. And Jews and Samaritans don't get along, don't like each other. This Jewish lawyer comes to question him about eternal life. And watch what Jesus does. A Jewish teacher speaking to a Jewish audience tells a story of a Samaritan hero. Not, not, not only that, but we must consider that the Samaritans are a part of the Jewish heritage because they trace their lineage back to Ephraim and Manasseh, who are the sons of Joseph. So they trace their history, their lineage, their heritage, their faith tradition back to the Jewish faith. The Jews and Samaritans really fell out over where they ought to worship. They, 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 they fell out about where the temple ought to be. The Jews wanted in one place, the Samaritans wanted another place. So watch this, stay with me. Jews and Samaritans claim the same heritage, claim the same history, claim the same lineage, claim to worship the same God, but the Jewish priest and the Levite walk by and the Samaritan stops as the hero. I think this is significant because I think this is a word for some of our Christian sisters and brothers who are a part of the same Christian heritage, part of the same Christian lineage, part of the same Christian history, read the same Christian scriptures in the same Christian Bible, worship the same Christian God, yet when there's a body laying in the street, somehow they become silent. When there's a body laying in the street, they pass by on the other side and do not open their mouth. All I'm saying is if you want to be a good neighbor, you've got to sacrifice so you can provide some relief for the hurting. Doesn't always have to be money, although we will take a check. Doesn't always have to be cash or monetary incentives. But I do believe that it involves some kind of sacrifice investment and some kind of uh, uh, action that provides relief and restoration to the one who is hurting. The Samaritan is not hesitant to part with his money. Samaritan is not hesitant to part with his, what gives him a sense of security because he parts with it in an effort to restore the hurt, pain, and injustice that was done to someone else. Beloved, I'm done. Can I tell you the only thing I love more about this story than the story itself? Only thing I love about this story more than the story itself is the storyteller. Because what the Samaritan did for the man, Jesus did for me. Jesus suffered for me. Jesus faced injustice for me. Jesus went to a cross for me. Jesus died for me, but that's not all he did because there's more to it than that. He didn't just die on the cross, but early on Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands for me. And, and I've never been robbed of physical possessions, thanks be unto God, but I've been 
a victim of life. I've, I've fallen on hard times. I've fallen on hard circumstances. I've been robbed of hope at some times. I've been robbed of joy at some time. I've been robbed of value sometimes. I've been robbed of worth sometimes. I've been wounded and hurting in life. People have walked by me like I didn't even exist, but I found a good neighbor in Jesus who secured my salvation on the cross, but he understood there's more to it than that. He came to see about me and what I love most about him, he didn't leave me where I was. He tended to my wounds, like it says in the text. He, he put me on track to my healing. He picked me up and placed me in the hands of the Holy Spirit to continue to take care of me. He put down a down payment on my healing. He opened a tab for me in his name for anything that I might need. He said, don't worry about the cost. I've already paid the price on the cross. I've already paid the price on Calvary. And he said, I've got to go for a little while, but you're in good hands with the Holy Spirit and rest assured I'm coming back again. That's what the Samaritan told the innkeeper. He said, I got to go, but I'm coming back again to bring this man with me and that's what Jesus says to us I, I'm leaving you in the hands of the Holy Spirit I'm, I'm leaving you in the hands of the Lord and I got everything that you need that's taken care of on my tab and I'm coming back one day for you because there's more to this than what you think there's more to this than what you thought before this is not all that there is what we're seeing is not all that there is there is more to it than this and Jesus Jesus is coming back to take us along with him. I got some stuff, Jesus says, I need to put right. I got some things I need to put in order. I have some stuff I need to reconcile in the earth. And I'm coming back for you one day. So just hold on a little while longer. Don't quit at this point. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up on what you got going. Stay strong in the Lord. Stay strong in his might because he's coming back for us and he has done everything that we need in this season so that we can go with him in the next all I'm saying the gospel good news is that Jesus died for me but there's more to it than that he lives for me now and I am called to live for him by loving him and loving my neighbor. That's the word of the Lord for us in this season. I hope it was a blessing to you. I want to offer you the opportunity to respond to our invitations. We have an invitation to come to Christ. So if you want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ because you've never made him Lord and Savior of your life, please let us know by sending us a message in our inbox. If you want to respond to the invitation to community, looking for a church home, and even though we may not be able to worship in person, God has spoken to you that this is the place he wants you to be, grow and mature, and live out your God-given calling. If that's you, send us a message on Facebook. Let us know you're responding to the invitation to community. And lastly, just an invitation to connect. If you need someone to pray with you, to stand with you, if you've fallen on hard times, and you need someone to sympathize with you, recognize your suffering, and uh, work with you to help relieve what it is that you're going through. Please send us a message on Facebook. Let us know you're responding to the invitation to connection. You can let us know as little or as much as you like. We'll reach back out to you, make sure we join with you in prayer, check on what you need, and try our best to do ministry uh, that will be a blessing to you. Invitation to Christ, invitation to community, invitation to connection. Send us a message so that we can respond accordingly. Listen, again, I hope this word was a blessing to you. I hope it uh, shines some light on some things for you. I hope it restored your hope and gave you some strength to keep on keeping on. I know we're going through so much in this season, um, but our prayer is that God will continue to see us through. I want you to continue to worship with us. Check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram, all of our social media accounts. Check out our website as well. We'll keep you updated on things going on here and when we'll be back in in-person worship. Listen, on behalf of myself, on behalf of uh, Dr. First Lady Tori Franklin and our family, Pastor Carpenter, Pastor Emeritus Carpenter, and his wife, Sister Melba Carpenter, and the entire Bethel family, 
We love you. We're praying for you and we miss you. Until next time, take care of yourself and be blessed. Peace.